Okay, why are we doing a series on fruit of the Spirit? Face it, we've all heard several sermons on the topic. Amen? Amen. Probably read a book or two on the topic. Maybe even took a class on the fruit of the Spirit. Huh? That's possible. So for many of us, this is old hat kind of stuff. But regardless, we all need a refresher from time to time, a reminder of what is important, what the Bible says about how we are to live. Because the world, the world would just as soon we forget how to live according to the Bible. The world wants us to engage in other activities or works. The world wants us just to blend in with the rest of the people so that Christians are indistinct from others. So, why are these characteristics called fruit? They are called the fruit of the Spirit because they emanate from our lives if we are yielded and growing in the Holy Spirit. Fruit is what is produced naturally from a fruit-bearing plant. The root of the word expresses delight or pleasure. An apple tree will produce the fruit, apples. Originally, the, the word fruit meant any kind of produce from the ground, including vegetables. But the word has evolved into meaning the sweet, fleshy product of a tree or other plant that contains seed and can be eaten as food. That from Oxford Dictionary Online. Just as an apple tree produces apples, so a Christian's life will produce fruit of the Spirit. Now, there's a lot of fruit imagery in the Bible. John uses fruit imagery in his gospel. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 says this, Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that does, does not bear fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them will bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Peter picks up the imagery of fruit also in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, where it says, For this very reason you, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness, and goodness with knowledge, think fruit, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with endurance, and endurance with good, godliness, and godliness with mutual affection, and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus also uses the imagery of fruit in Matthew 7, verses 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. So the Bible, there, there's many, many more examples. It's full of imagery of, of produce and fruit and so forth because it was written in a time when most people were very familiar with agriculture. Many were farmers themselves, or they had family members who were farmers. So the imagery of farming, producing fruit, was easily understood. Now, that's contrasted, contrasted with the works of the flesh. Paul and Galatians contrast these fruit of the Spirit with, with the works of the flesh, not in exact corollary, but in approximate comparison. Look at uh, Galatians 5, starting at verse 16. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, 
idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, as a preacher, I uh, would dearly love it if it, there was the same number of works of the flesh as there are fruits of the Spirit, because then you could, uh, you know, uh, do, do fun things back and forth with them. There are just nine fruits, but there are 15 works. I think that tells us that it's easier to do the works of the flesh than it is to share the fruit of the Spirit, uh, maybe. But uh, we can't package them into a nice, tidy pairing, unfortunately. But we can consider how they contrast and compare with one another. Listen again to the works of the flesh. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing. Fifteen. And that's not a complete list by any means. Now some of those works could be combined because several of them are related to others, but suffice it to say that these characteristics or actions are bad. So bad, in fact, that the scripture says those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a word that our world needs to hear today. <laughs> Truly, we need to hear that. So get ready for a 15-part sermon series on the works of the flesh <laughs> coming to a pulpit near you. Our scripture for this series draws, from, draws a distinction, and it carries on from where we just left off in Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 22. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity or goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, or generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It all starts with love. Love is the first one, and I think that's not by uh, coincidence. That is truly the one that kicks off the whole uh, list of fruit of the Spirit. Without a doubt, it's one of the most important words in the Bible. But the definition of biblical love is different from the world's definition. We've talked about this many times. We have to keep the two definitions distinct, lest we confuse the modern person. If we just talk about love to an ordinary modern person in this world today, they will think one thing, even though we're meaning something else. So we need to define what we mean by love. The word in Greek is agape. It means self-sacrificing love. It means preferring and acting for the good of the beloved. This kind of love is not a feeling. It is an action. We might better use the word loving rather than love to give it the sense of action going on, loving. Uh, God is loving. We should be loving one another, right? That, that, that may help us if we think that, even if we don't say that. Because the biblical notion of love is not about you. It's not about yourself. It's about the loved one. It's about the one you love. The opposite of Christian love is not hate. The opposite of Christian love is not hate. It is selfishness or self-centeredness. That's the opposite of agape. And we get those two confused because in the world, the opposite of love is hate, right? And if you don't love, then you must hate. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it, it's very, very frustrating. But the Christian notion of love, agape, the opposite of that is selfishness or self-centeredness. And our example is Jesus himself. As the familiar love chapter puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, the best definition of agape I can think of. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. 
It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's agape. Of course, we know that in Greek there are other words which we translate into English as love. There's philio, which is brotherly love or friendship, kind of a familial love. And then there's eros, a sexual love, a marital love. But agape is the word used in our passage in Galatians 5, also in 1 Corinthians 13, and many, many other places in the New Testament, including this passage from John's first letter, 1 John 4, 7 through 12, that uh, Karen read for us earlier. Beloved, let us love one another, agape, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, the context for this passage and for many others in, uh, in the New Testament is the love between brothers and sisters in the church. That's, that's where we learn how to love, in the family of faith. Because if we can't love one another in the church, then how can we love those outside the church? So we learn to love, agape, and we practice loving amongst ourselves so that we can show the love of God to the world through our lives. This is what bearing fruit is about, and it all starts with love. As I've said, Christian love is different from what the world considers love. Jesus gives us a corrective definition in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 45. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. The world defines love as being only for those who are like us or who like us, not our enemies, not those we disagree with. But Jesus instructs us to love even our enemies. In fact, he says that all of the law and the prophets can be summarized in just two commandments, Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It all starts with love. And if you struggle with sin, and who doesn't, Proverbs counsels us not to hate, but to love. Proverbs 10, verse 12, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Peter picks up on this proverb in his passage in 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Love should be that which characterizes the followers of Jesus. John 13, 34 and 35 has Jesus saying, I give you a new commandment, commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love, agape, for one another. Like I said, we learn and practice love in the church so that we can show forth what lives lived in love look like to the outside world. Love is the central attribute of God, so it should be the primary, the first fruit of those who belong to God. Pastor Jeff Greenway, the vice chairperson of the Global Council of the Wesleyan Covenant Association, posted this this week. Love, regardless of another person's religion, race, ethnicity, gender, social economic status, or any other way we define or identify one another, do you love people like Jesus? 
Rather than standing in judgment and criticism, choose to love because that's what Jesus would do and we're all created in his image. It doesn't mean you don't stand up for the truth. It means that you treat people with love and respect regardless of their opinions, regardless of their positions. Sometimes we get so caught up in telling the truth in our age of falsehoods and downright lies that we forget that truth-telling is not a fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> but love is. And we need to have love characterize everything we do and say, including our truth-telling. Love should be the theme song of our lives, as it was for Jesus. Next week, we'll tackle the next fruit of the Spirit, joy. And I want you to read 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9 in preparation. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Now let us spend a few moments in silent reflection as we consider what God may be whispering to our spirits. <laughs> 